Do you like it? Do you enjoy yourself? Is it that way? Do you want to play your part?
If you haven't watched that reading from Bishop Singh, please look for it in our communications. He seems wise and funny and kind, just what we need. November 7th, we will celebrate the Feast of All Saints. It's one of our favorites. Near the altar, we set up a place to remember all of the saints who've gone before us, big saints and little saints, that have died and entered into the near presence of God. This is where we all remember in a, youth, a unique way the Feast of All Saints. So, on November 7th, mark your calendars to be present, bring a picture or a relic of those that you love but see no longer. We will celebrate their connection to you, to this parish, and to the divine. There are more announcements and things going on in the eagle so be sure to sign up for that if you're not already receiving it. And now, I invite you to join me in taking a few deep breaths to arrive from all the places you've been this week. And to remember the successes and the failures, our presence and our absence, the joys and the pains of your life as a disciple.
<clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today is a reading from the book of Job. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comfort him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Hesia, and the third Karen Hepha. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived for 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Here, what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 34 responsibly by the new verse. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. <laughs> Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon him and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him, and he will deliver them. It is to see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them. Him out of them all. He will keep safe all of his bones, not one of them shall be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. If the Lord ransoms the life of his servants, and none will be punished for trust in him. Our second reading is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The former priests were many in number. Because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for those of his people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Here with the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and the large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord. Lord. Praise. God wants you to take bold risk. God wants 
wants you to take a risk. The participants, myself included, shared what they felt happening when the presenter asked these questions, and almost all of them expressed some kind of anxious feeling. Tight chest, dry mouth, heart palpitations, upset stomach even, while others said things like excited, hopeful, energized. <laughs> it was so fascinating to me because our church, the Episcopal Church, is rather risk avoidant in its nature, right? We have predictable almost everything. Liturgy, financial statements, clergy, property, lawn care, investment policies. We are what they call stable, aren't we? We've been around the block a few times and have learned a thing or two about a thing or two, right? So why would the church invest in these folks from all over the country who want to take risks with its people and properties, even if the outcome may lead to health, connection, community, belonging, and growth? Why would they be asking us to intentionally try things that might not work? that might not be here for the next generation. I have been thinking about these questions a lot in the context of the invitation that Christian and I sense the church exploring as we navigate this pandemic. What it means to be church, to be the gathered community, as Wendell Berry says. In some ways, we can never go back to the way it was, right? There possibly are some of our people who will never return to in-person worship. And that is sad to me. It breaks my heart, in fact, and keeps me up at night. Especially in light of the growth we were experiencing leading up to the pandemic. Do you remember that? I barely do. This way of being has taken a toll on my memory. You too? This is hard work with a small lot of us who show up every week. And I want you to know that I see you. We see you. And we're in this together. But I think it's important for us to consider what risks God might be creating space for us as a parish to take. For the sake of the kingdom of God and for Benzie County. And I wonder what that does to you when you hear that. I wonder what comes to mind when you hear me say that the church is being invited to take a risk. To ask, what are we doing well? And what aren't we doing well? What behaviors and practices will be important to us as we name our intentions around this new risk we're discerning God is asking us to take? There's a legend within Judaism about the tradition of rabbis and their Talmudim, which means teachers and students. That in ancient Galilee, rabbis would have a school of students, Talmudim, that were in what we call discernment about becoming rabbis. The Talmudim was to read, mark, and inwardly digest every morsel of the Torah and their teachers' behaviors, speech, and patterns. They were said to follow so closely that they would literally be covered in the dust of their rabbis. So in this morning's gospel, when Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside and heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I hear a deep desire within Bartimaeus, within his story that longed to be near this teacher. And interestingly, at first, the text tells us that Jesus' disciples sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. If those many were followers of Jesus and the way, wouldn't they have known how Jesus would have responded to this man's request? Or were they harboring bitterness because they had just been schooled in what Jesus is to give and what is not? I wonder. Because the gospel tells us that Jesus responded to the man with a level of compassion and patience and understanding that he did not seem to possess for his closest followers, right? It says Jesus stood still and said, call him here. I love that. Bartimaeus
Bartimaeus is so surprised by this invitation that he threw off his only possession, his cloak. It says he sprang up and came to Jesus. What would it look like if we responded to Jesus with that same enthusiasm? If we responded to the divine's invitation to explore the spirituality of Christian community here, now, in this place with these people. To explore the spirituality of risk with these folks in this place at this time in your life. Because what Jesus said next to him was, what do you want me to do for you? Now, it would be tempting to think that this story was about healing, and it kind of is. But healing is a loaded concept, when we, and one that we need to be careful of when exploring. And here's why. The church, in all her manifestations over the millennia, has, surprised at times, used these stories to abuse her people and shame them and keep them disconnected from God because of their interpretation of what otherness means in God's kingdom, right? I've heard pastors who have counseled their people that if their faith had been stronger, so-and-so would have been healed. They said things like, go, examine your sin and repent. And that is not to downplay any of the real healing that people experience every single day, myself included. That's not what I'm saying at all. What we need to be careful about with these stories within Scripture is how we use them to either expand the kingdom of God or cloister it off. Right? This story about Bartimaeus was as much about his, healing, his being healed as it was about him responding to Jesus' invitation to follow him. And good old Bart got it, didn't he? He understood in some ways more so than these folks who've been covered in Jesus' dust for the last however many weeks, months, and years, right? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. So, church, these are important teachings to wrestle with as we move into a new liturgical year. As we continue to dip our toes into how to be together safely during a pandemic. But we aren't asked to do this work alone, in a silo. We have been called into a fellowship for solace and comfort, for strength and knowing, being, and doing. We have been called into this work as disciples of Jesus to help God co-create heaven on earth, to bring hope and healing to the margins of our community, and to be change agents, agitators for the good, to cast off our only comfort in life and follow him. Amen. I invite you now to stand with me and together proclaim the words of our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made again. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and then his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead.
and the life of the world to come. Amen. And in peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, the world, especially for Joe, our president, and Gretchen, our governor. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray for Michael, presiding bishop, the Standing Committee of Eastern Michigan, and the Standing Committee of Western Michigan. For our partner diocese and their bishops, Bonnie, Bishop of Michigan, Rayford, Bishop of Northern Michigan, Moises, Bishop of the Dominican Republic, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Craig, Bishop of the Northwest Lower Michigan Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We pray for all those in our diocese, in diocese concerning calls to ministry, both lay and ordained. In particular, we pray for those in our diocese preparing for the sacred order of priests, including Alicia, Joe, Natalie, Alex, Derek, Catherine, Rebecca, Matt, Belle, Joanna, Kurt, and Anne Marie. We pray also for those in our diocese preparing for the sacred order of deacons, including Joy, Trish, Mark, Jim, Michelle, and Linda. We remember with gratitude the retired clergy of the diocese. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In our parish cycle of prayers, we remember our clergy and elected leaders. So Christian and Jody are priests. Our vestry and their officers, Barb, Mike, Joy, Rachel, Wendy, Holly, Susan and Carol, our delegates and alternates to diocesan conventions, Debbie, Patricia, Mike, and Joy, pray that they will have the wisdom to build on the path and the courage to lead us into a bright future. For all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God, we pray for Gregory and Margaret Sammons, Helene Saunders, Don and Wiley Schaefer, the families we serve at the Baby Pantry, and all who use this space to bring about beauty and healing in our world. Pray that they may find and be found by God. We also pray for the mission and ministry of St. Mark's Grand Rapids, Christian Mercado Rector, St. Augustine's Benton Harbor, Cynthia Caruso Rector, for the diocesan conventions. For those in need of healing, especially Blanche, Dorothy, Carol, Joanne, Arlene, Barbara, Susan, Preston, Frank, Mark, Elmer, Dave, Don, Maggie, Linnea, Barb, and all those who have asked for our prayers. We give God thanks for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant, Becky Ogilvy, as she begins another year. We also thank you for the love and witness of those beginning another year of married life. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have 
a place in your internal community. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Lord, I trust in you. We praise you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, O Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things done and not done, and so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in the midst of life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. church, there is no one who is ineligible or unwelcome to celebrate Eucharist at God's table. Our altar is the table of our loving God, a table set to feed all of creation through the love of Jesus Christ. You who are a part of that creation are most welcome, indeed invited to partake. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and grace. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and had their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us, by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory, and their unending hymn. <laughs>
God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts with faith and thanksgiving.
Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journeyed away with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.